Praise God. It's good to see all your little happy faces or your, your bright and shiny faces this morning. I'm glad y'all made it here today. Uh, we're going to be reading out of Isaiah 1, 18 through 20. Isaiah 1, 18 through 20. It says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord is has spoken it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you would speak your word this morning, Lord, and that you would use me as a vessel and a mouthpiece, Lord, to speak your word. I pray that you would anoint the word, Lord, that comes out, that it would reach deep inside the heart of the hearer, and that it would change, it would change us, Lord, that it would change us where we are, and that it would help us to get up and move in the right direction. Yes. Kind of interesting, a little bit of the theme that's going on this morning, because I ended up titling my message. I was kind of looking for a title to, title to pull it all together. I ended up titling it, It Seems Like I Keep Going in Circles. This book was written uh, for God's people about 700 years before the birth of Christ. This book was written to the children of Israel whenever a lot of things were going bad. In other words, they weren't following really after God the way that they should. You know, many times there's things going on in the life of God's people, and not everybody knows all your business. Sometimes people know your business, but sometimes it's just you and the Lord, and only the Lord knows knows your business. And and many times, whenever that kind of happens, that thing happens, it, things don't go our way. I don't know about you, but sometimes things are flowing for me. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, man, God's being good to me. I'm talking about, I drive up in Walmart parking lot, and just in time, the perfect person moved out of the way, and whoop, there it is, right there, just the perfect parking spot. And then sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, dude, I'll never find a parking. What did I do wrong, Lord? You know, so, <laughs> hey, what, what's going on? Hey, you, you get the point that I'm trying to make. The main purpose of this book that God spoke through Isaiah was to remind God's people that they had a special relationship with him, that they were his nation, that he had created them, that he was in covenant with them. Because you see, there's going to come a time in this story that, that, where, where their enemy, because they haven't been following after God, their enemy is going to take them captive. And that can happen even in the New Testament believer's life. Where the choices that we make and the lifestyle that we live, if we're, not, if we're not careful and we're not listening to the voice of the Lord, we can get stuck there. And the enemy holds us in bondage. It's another way to say Mari Clay. The enemy of our soul will hold us in bondage. It's almost like he throws us into a jail cell and we can't get out spiritually speaking. And we're stuck in a place. But I got good news for you this morning. You don't have to be stuck Stay stuck in a spiritual jail cell. The Lord has a key. Hallelujah. It was Jesus. And what he did for us at the cross. And he will allow that key to open up the door. To, and to release you. And to let you be set free. Amen. To go free. Amen. You know the New Testament. Speaks about this concept about. This special relationship that God has with people. Look at 1 Peter 2.9. See, Israel in the Old Testament was God's special people. But I want you to know that, you know, sometimes we get in the Old. I'd like to preach out of the Old Testament. And people are like, man, that's Old Testament stuff. That doesn't mean, no, no, no. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God has always had a people. Amen? Are you the people of God this morning? That's, a, that's, a, that's something that you and I and people watching on video have to question in our lives. Are we the people of God? Are we truly the people of God? Are, and what, what does that mean? Are we going to serve God? I know that's been my theme lately. Are we going to serve God or are we going to serve ourselves? Are we going to serve God or are we going to serve, serve the world? And, and so God wanted to write this letter to say, hey, listen, you are my people. You're a special people. We'll look at 1 Peter 2, 9. He says you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. A holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. You know, one, one thing I want you to know that that word chosen generation in the Greek, it's, it's a word that means election. But, it, but, but the word is eklektos, E-K-E. 
L-E-K-T-O-S. Election, but that word ek means out. So what were you chosen out of? What were you, what were you pulled out of? Well, I mean, if you had to imagine in your mind and in your heart, understanding maybe some of the things that you understand about Christianity now, what do you think God means that you were pulled out of? You were pulled out of the world. Well, how do you get that? Because the first time you were born, you were born like your father Adam in sin. And you were born into a world that was fallen. Do you know that the world is fallen? Come on, church, help me out a little bit. Amen. The church is fallen. The music of the, I'm sorry, the world is fallen. The music of the world is fallen. The ways of the world are fallen. It's tainted by sin. Thorn and thistle grow out of the ground. People's natures are born from their mother already bound up with sin. But the word of God says you can be born again. And when you get born again, it means you're chosen out. It means God's pulling you out. I don't know what they're preaching down the road. And I'm not trying to pick on them. They're going to preach what they're going to preach. But I got to preach what I see in the word of God. And God's not okay with us cozying up with the world. God's not okay with us inviting the world in. Yes, people of the world, please come into the church. But let the real Jesus do a work in your heart. And let him change you on the inside. And praise God, you ought not walk out the same way you came in Jesus' name. When the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you and he's moving in you, he's changing you and he's Stirring things up on the inside of you. That's what the word of God teaches. You're the eclectos. You're the called out ones. You're the chosen out ones. How'd you get chosen out through Jesus? He went before you. The word of God teaches us that he's our pioneer of salvation. That he went for us. He went before us and he paved the way. Hallelujah. He tasted death for you and I. And he bore our sins when he died on the cross. (coughs) He paid the penalty for the sins of the human race. That's why he resurrected. Amen. Because he had no sin in him. And now when we put faith in that, we become new creations in Christ. So we're the chosen generation. You know, this generation right here, the word sometimes it means a, a time frame. But right here, that's not what it means. It means a race of people with a common life. You're a race of people with a common life. Not, you're not connected by skin color. You're not connected by family, physical family heritage. No, you're connected by the blood of Jesus. Amen. The blood of Jesus is thicker than your family blood. Oh no, if you're truly a child of God and you are truly born again, then you're... Then then Christians that you know, Christians that you fellowship with, the people that you come to church with, there should be a closer walk and a closer relationship. And not saying that, you, that you're not going to love your family. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what I am trying to say is, is that many times your physical family is not going to understand the things of God the way your church family will. And, there's, and the truth of the matter is, is that that many times can cause division and separation between because you got to make a decision. You're either going to serve the Lord or you're going to continue to stay connected to that physical family that may be trying to draw you away. Now, if that doesn't sound right, I'm here to tell you what Jesus said. Unless you hate your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, you will have none of them. What are you talking about, Jesus? You want me to hate my family? Jesus doesn't want you to hate anybody. Jesus' point is this. If your mother or your father or your brother or your sister get in the way of you continuing to come after me, then you better sever ties ties with those people and you better turn around and you better follow after me. Because Jesus is saying, I'm worth it. Jesus is saying, I went the extra mile for you and I made a way for you and I'm worth it for you to follow after me. Listen to me. I don't care how close they are to you. If they try to prevent you from moving forward in the things of God... Don't follow them. Mm-hmm. And they don't want to come to church. Okay, that's fine. Leave them at home. Mm-hmm. Pray for them. I'm not telling you to be mean to them. Pray for them. Mm-hmm. But if they don't want to come into the house of God and they don't want to follow after the Lord, don't you follow them. Follow Jesus. Mm-hmm. Amen? Mm-hmm. So that was the first thing that I wanted, I wanted you to see there, that, that God has a special people because we're talking about Israel and we're talking about the place where they were and that they were engaging in some things that God foresaw that it was going to cause them some problems. And so he wrote this book through Isaiah to warn his people and to prepare them. Listen, it hadn't even happened yet. 
but you're about to find yourself in captivity. He wrote most. Listen, there's there's something called out there liberal scholars. If you watch the History Channel, be careful because they hire these what they're called liberal scholars. You know what that means? With those people that talk about the Bible on the History Channel, they don't believe that the Bible is the word of God. And all they do is they study it as another book and they don't believe in prophecy. So liberal scholars don't even believe that Isaiah wrote this book because guess what? Isaiah prophesied. The Holy Spirit prophesied and foretold the future and told Israel it hasn't even happened yet. But because of your behavior, you are going to find yourself in a jail cell. Your enemy is going to take you captive. He's going to bring you to Babylon and you are going to become slaves to your enemy. But good news, good news, because I'm not going to leave you over there. Before they even come and get you and make you captive and put you in the jail cell, I'm letting you know I'm going to deliver you. I'm letting you know I'm going to bring freedom and liberty to your life. So I got good news for you this morning because if you find yourself in a stuck place, if you find yourself in a spiritual jail cell, the Lord knew you was going to be there before you ever showed up over there. The Lord already provided a key. His name is Jesus, and he's coming to rescue you. Amen? That's the first thing I want you to see, though, is that you are a chosen generation. You are a holy nation. Amen? That's part of God's plan, that his people would be brought out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Whether it was his Old Testament or his New Testament people, the light of God through his word reveals the way that he wants his people to go. Amen. In this book, Isaiah uses the words highway and the word remnant several times. He uses the word highway five times and remnant eight times. Angie had drawn this little thing up on the board. I was going to leave it, but somebody erased it. And it was interesting to me because it was like a highway. Well, I'll just draw what she drew. It was something like this anyway. It was like a, it was a highway that had a, that had a fork in the road. And one was across and moved you towards God. And this one here had a sin and moved you towards hell. And then one of the kids last night, he said, well, we need a bridge up here in case we go down the wrong road. Well, that was good, huh? said, yeah, draw another one right there. And I'm like, wow, take that kid out. He's like, because we sometimes we go down the wrong road. But I don't, but then we realize we don't want to be on that road no more. No stress, don't fret, child of God. He made it, you got a bridge. Amen. You can turn. Amen. Amen. And that's what I want. He uses the word, and I had already written this message whenever they put that up there. And as a matter of fact, the kid said this, and I had it in my message. He said, sometimes we choose to go this way because it looks like there's something good over here. Yeah. I don't know what you put there, like a little, we'll just put like a little star. It looks good. It's shiny. It's bright. And so we're like, man, look at that. Whatever's at the end of that road, there's a, there's a pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. I'm going to take a little left turn right here. He said, but man, we got to be able to get back, right? And so that's what I wanted you to know, that five different times the word highway was talked about and eight times the word remnant was talked about. Look at John 14, 6. This is a New Testament verse that uses the same concept of the highway. It says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And that word way right there in the Greek is hadas, and the literal word means a road. Jesus is the road. Jesus is the pathway to get to God. Hallelujah. The, the word remnant means a smaller portion. You know what it means? Is that always the people of God, everything that you see that fills the churches in the Old Testament, all the people that called themselves Jews or, or Israelites, they weren't all the people of God. There was a bigger group that was saying that they were, but there was a smaller group that was really following after God. Now, I'm not here to tell you, oh, yes, the preacher is the one that's really following after God. That's not my point here. My point is, is that there's in, in, basically in the modern church, there's a whole lot of people that profess Christianity. Right. But what I'm here to tell you is, is that not every single person that says that they're a Christian is really living their life out in Christianity. And we got to know the difference. Amen. I'd be a good I'd be a bad preacher if I didn't say that. Look at Matthew 7, 21. 
Not everyone, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now the truth is, is that you can't do the will of God without the grace of God. Amen. The grace of God strengthens you and gives you power. How do you get access to grace? Jesus already died to give it to you. But you got to want it. You got to want to get out the swamp. You got to want to get up, pick up your bed and walk. Amen. So I guess one of the first concepts is a wrong way down a one way. God's people in this story of Isaiah had been traveling the wrong way. They were about to be taken captive by their enemy. And before it would even happen, God would write this book to let them know he was going to set them free. There's something about traveling on the wrong road. There's a reason that we do it. and It's because it looks something shiny and bright at the end of that destination. It appears like it's something that we want. I'm walking on this road because there is something at the end of it that entices me and looks good and I want it. Unfortunately, the other road never brings us where we really want to go. Right. When we're God's people, that road that we take that goes in the wrong direction, it never brings us where we really want to go. I guess maybe we should define what God's people means. It means that you're born again, and when you're born again, the Spirit of God lives in you. Are you born again this morning? Amen? Amen? And I, it's a more of a rhetorical question. I'm not asking everybody to jump up and give a testimony, although if you want to, you can. But the, it's a rhetorical question. Are you born again? How do I get born again? You heard the good news about Jesus. You realized you were a sinner and that you needed Jesus. And what you did was you invited him in. You asked forgiveness of your sin. And you asked God to take your life and that you want to give your life back to him. Amen? Amen. And if, whenever you mean business with God, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. And that's what it means to be born again. Spirit of God, after you get born again, he will begin to tell you to walk the right road. But the flesh says, but this road looks good. This road's prettier. It shines. That's what entices us. Something looks better on the other road. So we take a turn. But it never turns out to be what we imagined it would be. I'm not about worldly music, and you know that. But I remember these lyrics to this old song that I used to listen to way back whenever I was in high school. Still, the biggest selling song ever. Y'all might even recognize it. There's a lady who knows. Y'all already know what that is. Some of you do. There's a lady that knows all that glitters is gold, and she's buying a stairway to heaven. All that glitters is gold is what the song's saying. Besides the fact that this, now, you know you know me, i got to tell the whole story. Besides the fact that this song was written by Led Zeppelin in Jimmy Page's house, who's a self-professing Satanist, and he bought the house from Aleister Crowley. Okay, do I need to say any more? If you don't know anything about Aleister Crowley, you just need to do your own little Google search. Besides all of that, she, she knows all that glitters is gold? Well, that's a lie. <laughs> because, see, pyrite glitters, but it isn't real gold. As a matter of fact, its common name is fool's gold. The right road is the path that follows Jesus, and we're pursuing that path. The Word of God and the Spirit of God will work in unison with one another and mold us into the image of Jesus. If we're following after the right road, what's going to happen is, is that God's going to mold us. And each and every day, as we submit to God, he's going to teach us his ways. He's going to renew our mind. He's going to renew our thinking. And he's going to show us that what's really important on this earth is to be molded and conformed into the image of Jesus. Not what we can get out the deal. Amen. Jesus wasn't about what he could get out the deal. But if you will follow after God, he will still, he will bless you. It's going to be like fringe benefits of serving God. I believe that if we are faithful to God, and listen, but it doesn't happen overnight. Yes, sometimes you might get an overnight promotion. But I'm here to tell you that typically the way that God works is, is that he is molding you and preparing you. And he doesn't want you, he doesn't want to rush the process. Okay. And because he's trying to teach us patience. Amen. And we're over here praying for God to move and for this to happen. And God's, God knows better than you do. Yeah. 
whether or not you're really ready for what it is that you're asking for. And that's really, I, this is, has nothing to do with my message, but I'm telling, I mean, this little part here, but I think God wants to say it. That's one of our biggest problems. We think we're ready for something before God says we're ready for it. And so therefore, guess what we're doing? We're not trusting him. We're not trusting him. We take matters into our own hands and we make something happen. Whatever that is, that can be a financial purchase. That can be a job decision. That can be a relationship decision. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. That can affect every area of our lives. It's not to say that God didn't want to give you a different job and to promote you. But if you walked out on your own instead of waiting on God, and I've already told my story too many times to tell it again on how that almost happened to me. Same thing with relationships. Same things with financial decisions. Oh, but I make this amount of money and I deserve this kind of vehicle because da, 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 da. And look, I've already been through all that. I can remember one time a preacher told me, he said, dude, I bought that car for, for, um, for my wife. And immediately, as soon as I signed the paperwork, I felt worried about it. I was like, well, dude, look, this is the thing. God will get you through it. God's going to get you through it. But he was trying to tell you before he signed the paperwork. You know, if your heart starts beating fast and you start feeling weird about it, then the Lord's trying to say something. And it's like if your heart's beating fast over, it's like, oh, yeah, it's because I love this thing so much. No, no, maybe the Lord's trying to deal with me. And then it's, but sometimes we find ourselves, it's like the devil got our hand and we're like, I'm going to sign it anyway. And the reason I can talk about it is because that's what happened when I bought my timeshare. I've told y'all that story, right? The Lord was pounding on my chest saying, don't sign that. Don't buy that. What are you doing? But I, I did it anyway. And now sometimes I feel like I'm trapped. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I get something out of it. But, and God got me through it. But God wants to teach us something. Amen? Fool's gold road leads to heart rate, heartache and disappointment. I was trying to make those two words rhyme. And what I did was I messed my, did a tongue twister. Fool's gold road leads to heartache and disappointment. It never brings us to where we thought we were going to go. When our cho choices to turn have their way in our lives, the result will at some time become broken relationships. We're talking about going in circles this morning. Broken relationships that result in broken hearts, decisions that will lead to financial ruin, decisions that will lead to physical destruction, decisions that will lead to emotional turmoil. We find ourselves heartbroken again. We find ourselves in debt again. We find ourselves in trouble with the law again. We find ourselves lonely again, and we will keep going in circles again because the wrong road is like a roundabout. Amen. I've been spending a little time in Youngsville lately, and they got roundabouts all over the place. And one of the things that I learned about a roundabout is, is that usually you got four different directions you can go in, right? You got this road, that road, that road, that road. But you can just stay on that thing. Right. And if all of these roads are the wrong destination, guess what happens? And let's just say that's the right destination. I know I went to the left. The Bible does say go west, young man. <laughs> but I'm going in circles and I'm like, oh, look, that looks bright and shiny. Let me take a little detour right there. Oh, Lord. It didn't turn out to what I thought it was going to be. So let me get back on the road. But guess what? This road, eh, it just, I don't know. I just see something glittering over here. This, I mean, I got this road to go down if I choose to go down there. I know Jesus isn't going to leave me. I'm just going to save that for later. And so I go around in circles again. I'm like, okay, let me spin off and go try this for a little bit. Whatever this is. It, but yet it leads to the same old thing. Disappointment. Heartache. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and you get the point. That I keep on going down. Sometimes it's not even the same road. But if you'll notice... If I keep going down and I end back up on, I'm going in circles. And I end up seeing the same thing. Have you ever been lost before? And you're like, wait, hold on a second. I think I pretty much just saw this. <laughs> and you keep going in the same destination. That's what it had to be like for the children of Israel when they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years going around in circles. I'm pretty sure I saw that palm tree last, last time we came around here. And sometimes that's what we find is, it, 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 you know, the, the wrong road is like a roundabout as opposed to the right road is the straight and narrow. Yeah. It leads to life. 
God has an intended purpose. And it's not even that he's just trying to control you. That's what, that's what the enemy was trying to lie to you. You know, that's the word that the, that the occultists believe. People that believe in the devil. You know what they believe? Oh, God, God entra- the big God entrapped mankind inside this flesh. But our God wants to release us out and give us freedom. And so we can do whatever it is that we want to do. Yeah, well, you do whatever you want to do on this end. And guess what it's going to lead to? It's going to lead to a heartache, disappointment, despair. Yes. Yes. A miry clay, a swamp that you can't get out of. Stuck at night and the skeeters biting. <laughs> That'd be bad. And that roundabout will keep bringing us by the same scenery again and again. Heartbreak hill, hole in my pocket curve, sirens in my rearview mirror. And after a while, the same scenery gets old. But we're always in search of something new and we always look for a new road to jump on to fill the emptiness inside because we're just never satisfied with Jesus alone. Mm. Come on, somebody, help me preach this message because you know what I'm telling you is true. We just never seem to be satisfied with Jesus alone. Jesus, yes, but and I need that too. I'm talking to the preacher, every last one of us. Jesus, yes. And listen, this is stuff that's deep on the inside of us. I can't read it on your forehead, but I know it's in you because we all got the same thing. We're all human beings. We all have a sinful nature. And, and the enemy is always trying to pull us off course and to tr- cause us to go after something that's going to be more shiny, more exciting. Amen. And, it's, and, and just trying to entice us to go in the wrong way. You know, there's something, there's got to be something good to stability. Yeah. Even the song that we sang. What, what did the song say? You've taken me from the miry clay. And where did you put me? Oh. Set my feet upon the rock. Yeah. And now I know. See, a, a rock doesn't move. A rock's just standing. A rock might even seem boring. <laughs> Same old rock just been sitting there. But the waves can't erode it. Come on. The waves don't move it. The wind blowing doesn't move it. It's stationary, but it's strong. Hallelujah. You can trust in it. When I wake up the water, that rock's going to still be in that same place. Let me stand up on this rock. Let me build my foundation. Let this rock be my foundation. Let me build my house right here. But no, 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 no. I'm always looking for something new. I want something new. I want something exciting. I want something happening. Right? And Lord, help us. I mean, if you watch children's shows nowadays... I'm just saying, like, I don't watch them a lot, but the last time I saw them, I went on vacation about three years ago, and I walked in the room, and Isabella was watching Spongebob. <laughs> She's college, but she was watching Spongebob. I was like, oh, my gosh, dude, the scene's changing every three seconds. Something new every three seconds. I mean, people's brains now are to the point where, like, dude, I'm bored with you. Like, you, you, you know, I'm done with you. you. You don't excite me anymore. I want the smell of something new. I want something fresh. Well, guess what? The word of God told Jeremiah, follow the old path. Go the old ways. Hallelujah. Follow after the old ways. We're always in search of something new. Jesus alone won't do it for us anymore. And here we go around that roundabout again. It might have looked different than the last one, but once we're on it, there it is again. Heartbreak Hill. Hole in my pocket curve, and sooner or later we will ask, Why, Lord? Yes. Sooner or later, I'm telling you right now, we will ask, Why, Lord? I can remember Sean, I can remember and Sean's in California again, and I can remember ministering the gospel to him. It's a long story, but I talked to him about the Lord, kind of pursued him a little bit, and then some things happened in his life. He found himself in California, and he was driving. It was his birthday, he got saved on his birthday. And he was driving back from Oakland, California to Bakersfield, California in his truck. And he said, why, Lord? Why is it the same old thing over and over? Why do I find myself falling into the same old trap over and over again? And he said, the Lord started answering him back. The Lord started answering him back. (laughs) Sometimes when the Lord answers, because when it's finally time for him to answer, because it's like you're not. And if you ask that question a year in advance, he's might be he might be silent. And you know why? Because he's he knows you're not really ready yet. You're not really ready to have this conversation yet. So I'm going to let you stay there a little bit longer. And then once you're really ready, 
Then I'm going to talk to you. Yeah. When you ask it and you really mean it, then we're going to have this conversation. And so that's what point number two is this. Stop and listen. See, that's when God says, according to the passage that we read, how did it start off? Come, let us reason together. That's what the Lord says. Come and let us reason together. I want to have a sit down with you. I want to sit down. Let's talk it out. Let's get to the bottom and the root cause of why you keep going around in circles. Why you keep seeing the same image. If you really want to know, come talk to me. My child, come and have a sit down with me. He wants to have a sit down and talk. and He wants to explain to us why all this stuff keeps happening. Why can't anything go right? He wants to reason and get us to the right conclusion. Amen? Amen. Why do I keep going the wrong way? Why do I see these same results in my life over and over and over again? Well, it's either one of two things. Either it's a test of our faith. Because God will test your faith. Right. Listen to me. you got to understand. God will test your faith. Don't get mad at God when he allows you to be in a situation that you don't like. That makes you uncomfortable or even gets you angry towards the things of God or even in a church or, or whatever. Something that's going to happen. God will allow things to happen in your life to see whether you're going to hold on to him or not. God will never tempt you with evil. The word of God says in the book of James, God does not tempt with evil. But God will allow the enemy a certain amount of leeway to see if you will be drawn away. To see if you're going to bite the bait. To see if you're going to go in that wrong direction again. So it's either going to be a test of your faith or we just keep traveling down the wrong roads instead of the right road. And we're expecting a different result each time. But there won't be a different result. It will always result in this until we change directions. That brings me to the next point. Change of mind. That's repentance. Amen. The word repentance literally means to have a mind change and to go in a different direction. Only God can change a mindset. Do you believe that? Yes. Yes. Only God can change your mindset. Yes. Only God can yes. cause the atmosphere of a bar room <laughs> to now seem really uncool. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's I'm, I'm telling you about something I know about. I can talk about this. How, why? Because I used to live in bar rooms. I was hungry to go to the bar room. That was all I desired to do. And now I'm just saying, if I walk in one, sometimes if I walk in a restaurant that looks a little bit too much like a bar, I'm not trying to act self-righteous on you. Don't take this the wrong way. That's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to make a point. Something happened on the inside of me that changed something and changed my mindset. And now when I walk into a bar room, if it's all dark and dank and dusky, I feel like it's a, it's a place of darkness. I feel like it's a place of the world. I feel like it, it, I don't belong there anymore. It's because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of me. And he's been saying, what do you want to do? Do you want to stay stuck in the miry clay of this swamp? Or are you ready to get up and are you ready to walk out of here? Yeah. And I'm going to tell you something else, church. If you can still tolerate a barroom, I'm here to tell you it's not God's will in your life. I'm here to tell you it's not God's will in your life. And if you don't like that, then you've got a flesh problem that's trying to cause you to go against the word of the Lord. Because the word of the Lord will tell you, no, I don't want to hang out in there. Oh, yeah, you're going to tell me you're going in there telling people about Jesus? Okay. If that's what you're really doing, and, and listen, I'm talking about not bellying up to the bar and drinking with them and sharing your woes and your sorrows. No, I'm talking about rising up, walking up in there and letting the light of Jesus shine and being a distinct difference. That'd be one thing, but most of the time that ain't really what's happening to the Christian that finds himself back in the bar room. He's over there partaking with them, doing the same thing as what they're doing, and they're all sharing their woes. Oh man, but I know there's an answer. That's fine. Listen, we've all been in places like that before. And that's fine to be in that season for some period of time, but you can't live there forever. You got to get sooner or later. You got to, will you get up and walk? Will you pick up your bed and walk out of here? Will you let me deliver you? Or would you rather week after week, time after time, this is just an illustration, sit in that same old place 
and allow yourself to be stuck there. And whenever you get a little bit in you, whatever it is you put in you, you're like, oh yeah, man, I know God's real. I know Jesus is real. And just sit there and talk about Jesus while, you, while you're getting drunk and while you're doing whatever you're doing. And the only reason I'm even saying that is because I know for a fact I've had people tell me that, that, that they've done that on multiple occasions. And I've had other people share with me. So what I'm trying to say is only God can change a mindset. Only God can change the inner man to make him see different, to think different. But I used the ballroom as one, but I had music down there too. And I know I'm pound music. I do. Because listen, if the music that you listen to preaches to you and makes the world look like it's glittering and that because it glitters, it's gold. It's a lie. And it's trying to keep your mindset and it's trying to keep your soul connected connected to the world and the Lord wants to release you from the world the world the Lord wants to open up the door and let you out mm -hmm. but if you keep on allowing yourself to stay there oh it's glittery it must be gold no worldly possession same thing all kinds of things like this so repentance is a complete different direction than before turn and move towards the word turn and move towards Jesus if you're moving Towards sin, stop, turn, and move towards Jesus. The detour pulls me off course. It doesn't mean that I will never make it to the destination, right? Listen to me. They got too many Christians up in this place that have taken detours before. It doesn't mean that you're not going to make it to the right destination. But I think we can all agree every time we take a detour, it, it causes longer for us to get towards the intended destination. But it does mean that it will take me longer to get there. And it does mean that we will still see some of those old results instead of new results. Amen. Isaiah 1, 18 through 20. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet. I meant to bring a, a red shirt. And, and you know, I was going to say, hey, look, this is what it looks like to the Lord. Sin looks like that to the Lord. It's obvious. It's like a red flag flapping in the wind. Sometimes, listen, the only reason I'm doing that, the only reason I'm trying to be irritating and get your attention is because you need to know that this, you, might, we, you and I might be cold towards it. You and I might be hard towards it. But the reality of it is this. Hey, God's not cold towards it. He sees it. It's like a red flag flapping in the wind. But he's saying this. He's saying, though your sin might be scarlet, though it might be crimson, what I'm here to tell you is that it can be white like snow. It can be made like wool. The forgiveness of, the holy, of, the, of what Jesus has done for us. Yes. He, says, but it, he says, this is how it will happen. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That means that if you will be obedient to my word and my will, then you will be released and you will be blessed in where you are. But if you refuse and you rebel against it, your enemy is going to have power over you. <coughs> and so we repent when we hear that. Amen? Amen. We repent and we change directions. I want you to know that there's a prize at the end of this road. I'm going to get Aaron. If you could start passing out some communion. We've got a little ways to go. But we're going to take communion this morning. Amen. And I want to also tell you that. I mentioned it this morning. That you know. Whenever we had worship last week. And people were tearing at the altar. And some people were comfortable to stay. And, stay, and some people needed to go. I just want you to know that. I want that to be every Sunday. Amen. If you got somewhere to go. Then you be, feel free to go. But if you want to stay. In the presence of the Lord, just for a little while longer, just to worship the Lord. I just want to invite you and let you know that you're welcome. Amen. That you're welcome to be in the presence of the Lord. There's a prize at the end of this road. Look at Philippians 3, 12 through 14. This is the Apostle Paul. And this is what he says. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which I also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forget those things which are behind and reach forth unto those things which are before. 
I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, what the Apostle Paul was saying is, is that there's a whole lot of stuff in my rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of stuff behind me, and that's where I need to keep it. I need to keep it behind me. I don't want to keep seeing all of these situations. Listen, there's been a lot that he's gone through. Heartache, turmoil, struggles. At the same time, something happened to him. He said he hasn't attained it, and that means to seize it or grab hold of it. He hasn't quite gotten, gotten it completely because you know what? None of us will get it completely until we see the Lord. Amen. But he's striving after it. He's going in the right certain direction to go after the prize that God has. I got to tell you, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. The prize is that we can start looking more like Jesus. Amen. The prize is Jesus. Amen. The prize is that we're conformed into the image of Christ. If you were looking for a different kind of prize, you, you joined the wrong team. Yeah. So he hasn't grabbed the hole, but he follows after it. It means to pursue something in a hostile manner. Amen. I don't know how thirsty you are. I don't know how hungry you are. But you know what I'm talking about. When we're famished and we're hungry, when we're dehydrated, we run after water. We run after food. We, we desire it. We're hungry for it. That's how we need to be for the presence of the Lord. Amen. And he says, I haven't apprehended. It means to possess it. He says, I count not myself to have apprehended. I don't possess it completely, but this is what I do. I don't have it yet, but I'm going to tell you how to get there. The way that we get there is we forget those things which are behind. Yeah. You got to let go of it. What are you talking about, preacher? Anything from your past that prevents you from moving forward towards the prize. Anything from your past. What is it? I don't know. Old boyfriends, old girlfriends. I mean, that's just one example. Shame, guilt. Do you not know that the enemy of your soul, and especially at, since you've been a Christian, if you've gone in a wrong direction, if you've taken that detour and you've gone towards sin, he will try to never let you live it down. Yeah, that's it. Listen, there's got to be a balance here. Child of God, the message of the cross will give you and I freedom and liberty to walk in victory. Jesus paid a high price on the cross to give us his righteousness as a gift so that we could enter into the presence of God. And where the presence of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the presence of the Lord is, there is freedom. Yes, amen. And at the same time, we can't be so free in our Christianity that we're willing to just sip on sin every weekend when it rolls back around. Amen. Lord, help us. Help us to realize that that is not God's will for our life. And let us not be caught up in a swampy, miry clay. And let our conscience not be so seared that we don't see it the way that God sees it. Instead, let us see it and let us cry out to the Lord. Lord, move me in the right direction. Lord, pull me up out of this miry clay. Amen. That's how we're going to get there. Was number one, we're going to forget those things that are behind. Don't let the devil hold you down. In heartache and guilt. Don't let the devil oppress you. Get up and start walking towards Jesus. He's come to deliver us. And so we forget the things which are behind. And the second thing is this. We reach forward to those things which are before. We press toward the mark for the high prize of the calling of Christ Jesus. Maybe I could get the Naya and the musicians to come forward. Essentially, what Paul is saying is that the right road will lead you to the prize. And the prize here is that when we run on the right road, we will look more like Jesus every day until we finish the race and receive the victor's crown.